Let's turn our attention back to the events in the house of Matthew after he gave a dinner following his agreement to become one of Jesus' apostles. And you remember that there were Pharisees and other so-called sinners uh, that were at this dinner. It was also close proximity to one of the fast days of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were complaining at Jesus on multiple levels. First of all, that he was eating with these sinners, and also because he was eating at all, because it was supposed to be a traditional fast day. And they didn't like Jesus' answers, and that's just kind of par for the course at this point in the early second year of Jesus' ministry. Now, we had seen uh, Jesus' warning that you can't put old, or you can't put new wine into old wineskins. And so that's kind of the warning that his new covenant is not going to mesh up well with those that are quite set in their old ways, according to their traditions, uh, as the Pharisees were. Now, while he was talking, someone comes to ask for his assistance that was not at uh, this dinner complaining at him, which is good. Uh, This is from uh, Matthew chapter number 9, starting at verse number 18. Uh, We've got parallels to be found in Mark 5, uh, chapter uh, chapter 5, verse 22, and Luke chapter 8, verse 41. But we're going to begin in Matthew 9, 18. While he was saying these things to them, the things about you can't put new wine into old wineskins. Behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter is at her end. That's the more literal wording in the Greek. Um, I know the English Standard Version says, has just died, but we know that does not match the wording in Mark and Luke, uh, which say that, she was at the point of death, or that she was almost dead. Uh, So I want you to imagine that uh, what is being said here in the Greek is uh, to, to be better translated as, she's at her end. So my daughter has come to the end. Lay your hand on her and she will live. Now that's pretty clear to me that they understood, the translators understood that Jesus coming and laying his hands on her would give her life. Uh, And this guy doesn't seem to be looking for a resurrection just yet. Uh, Rather, he is looking for healing. So what happens? Matthew records that Jesus rose, that is, from the dinner table, and followed him with his disciples. So the whole entourage of Jesus and the twelve and other disciples, including probably the women that we know are following at this time, this whole great big group gets up and starts going through the streets toward this ruler's house. Now we know from the Mark account and the Luke account that his name is Jairus, or Jairus is the way you'll hear an awful lot of people say it in our English uh, he is the he is like the preacher of one of the local synagogues. So he's the one that would typically read and comment on the scripture each and every Sabbath day, and who would be probably in control of things like uh, the teaching of the of the younger men and women in the community to read and understand the Torah, understand the Tanakh, that is the Old Testament, uh, as, it's, as it's read by the Jewish people, and probably also uh, to be in control of um, who does the reading schedule and things of that nature uh, for the congregation of believers. Uh, but this guy has got a crisis that he wants Jesus to fix. And so while Jesus is on the way to his house, something else happens, which is not surprising because everywhere Jesus goes, there is a crowd 
seeking his supernatural intervention. Verse number 20. Behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him. Now, it is of interest to us that the young woman who uh, Jairus uh, is trying to get Jesus to come and heal is about 12 years old. So she is a young lady. This woman has had her particular illness for the same amount of time. Uh, and we need to describe this. It's not that she's got like an open wound, but it would appear that she has what a lot of people would refer to as um, spotting between her periods. Uh, because that caused trouble for Jewish ladies. Uh, the way that the ceremonial cleanliness or ceremonial in, uh, purity for uh, relating to the menstrual cycle was concerned is that from the day blood first appeared, the woman was then to be counted as, quote, unclean, end quote. Now, that's not got anything to do with cleanliness. It's got everything to do with blood is the product of life. It is the, it is the transport of life, and therefore it is to be held in high respect. So in this instance, the word unclean should actually be thought more along the lines of off-limits. So she is not to be moving around in general society once she starts her period. And uh, then, once the last bit of blood happens, so the, the day that there is no flow of blood, she can start counting. That would be day one, and she has to go up through day number seven. And then on day number eight, she can return to her normal procedures, her normal routine. Now, just as a side, um, for a side comment on this, uh, that sort of regulation would have uh, promoted a high pregnancy rate because since husbands could not engage in sexual relations with their wives until a week after their period was over with, uh, that's right around the time of ovulation uh, for the cycle. And so that's one of the reasons you got a high pregnancy rate in uh, the Jewish nation. Uh, but anyway, if a woman has spotting, then the count has to start all over again. And so this woman, for a period of 12 years, has never been able to reach the full seven-day count in order to be counted as clean again. And so her whole life has been disrupted. Uh, it is possible that in this society uh, where divorce was so easy that her husband may have divorced her. Uh, and so she may be on her own. And we also know that she was trying to get help from physicians but couldn't get any assistance. Uh, that's from Luke's account. Let me read to you from there. This is Luke uh, 8.43. There was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Uh, in fact, uh, she had become worse, according to the Mark 5, 26 uh, passage. Uh, so what happens here? Matthew 9 uh, tells us that she came up behind Jesus in the crowd and she touched the fringe of his garment, for she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Now we need to talk about this fringe of the garment. Uh, when I grew up in the church as a little kid, when I heard this story quite a few times uh, when I was a kid, the only hymn of the garment that I knew about 
uh, was the hymn on a skirt or a dress. And so I thought of the hymn down at the bottom of Jesus' um, clothing so that this woman was basically crawling on the ground, reaching up and grabbing the bottom of Jesus' robe, which I thought was really strange. But that's what the Bible said happened, so that must be the way it happened. And I've actually seen a few movies, cartoons, and pictures that portray it that way. That's not the case, though, folks. The hymn that we're referring to here is actually the fringe that was required by Mosaic law that was to be put at the corners of the outermost garment that a Jewish person was wearing. Uh, it was purple or bluish, uh, and it was either like a, a woven fringe or more likely like a little pom-pom uh, or strings uh, that were kind of in an explosion of a pom-pom shape. Uh, the wording in the Old Testament is the idea of prominence or flashiness. Uh, and so the point was they were supposed to have this on their outermost garment so that as they went about their day in their regular movement, this would flop around uh, on, in uh, the peripheral vision uh, of their eye. And every time they saw that bit of purple, that bit of blue, it was to remind them, you are part of the covenant people. Act like it. Remember, you're part of the covenant be like God. Uh, so this was like a little reminder uh, that they were supposed to have. Uh, and so all Jewish people, all religious Jewish people had this little bit of flash, this little bit of purple uh, that would have been up probably more like in the torso area. Now, modern day Jewish people, you will see wearing vests, or little, uh, 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 not smocks, but um, uh, uh, little shoulder coverings that have little strings hanging down from it. Uh, that's their more modern interpretation of what we're talking about here. It's their prayer shawl or their prayer clothing. Uh, so it, it's got the same idea, but I don't think it quite looks exactly the same that it did back in Old Testament times or in, in New Testament gospel times. Uh, but the point is, she is pushing into the crowd, which she shouldn't have been doing, by the way. Uh, according to the Jewish law, anybody that she touched while she was still having this bleeding issue would then be themselves made ceremonially unclean or off limits and have to go through a ceremony. Uh, and they would, have been, they would have been very upset if they'd known that she was touching them uh, in the crowd uh, being in this condition. Uh, but her idea is that if I can just touch his special little covenant fringe, I can be healed. I, I don't need for him to talk to me. I don't need for him uh, to uh, have my attention in order for this to happen. Uh, and we can get that understanding over in Mark's gospel. Let me read to you from Mark 5, 27. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, this is in her head, in her heart, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. So she is acting in faith. That's exactly what she's doing. She has heard stories. She has an understanding that Jesus can heal people. And she figures if he can heal people by talking to them, why can't he also heal me by just simply me reaching out and touching his little uh, prayer fringe or his covenant fringe? And what happens when she does that? Uh, well, we're in Mark, so let's read that. Immediately, the flow of the blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. So at that instant, 
she could feel it inside of her body that her bleeding problem had stopped. Uh, maybe there was this warm feeling that came over her, maybe a tingling electric feel. Uh, but whatever it was, suddenly she knew that she'd been healed. Now, she's not the only one that feels something at this point. Because verse 30 of Mark 5 says, Jesus, perceiving in himself that power, that'd be supernatural energy, had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? So apparently, whenever Jesus did miracles, he could feel energy moving from himself to the other person. Uh, and now, even though he wasn't actively healing anyone, he felt that feeling. Now, this is one of those strange times that we are reminded Jesus was limited, according to the principles of Philippians chapter 2, to certain bits of knowledge and ability. Uh, he, even though he was God himself, emptied himself of all of his divine prerogatives and took on the form of a human, and being found in that form became obedient even to death on the cross. That's the Philippians 2 uh, idea of his emptying himself of his divine prerogatives. So he actually does not know who it is that touched him that got this energy flow into their body. And so his disciples, as soon as he said, who touched me? Uh, they're like, what? Uh, in fact, this is the way Luke puts it. Luke uh, 8.45, Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you. They're pressing in on you. Uh, and then uh, in the Mark account, uh, Mark 5.31 goes on to ask the question, and yet you say, who touched me? It's like, are you kidding? Everybody's touching you is effectively what Peter and the apostles are saying. Uh, but the Mark 5, verse 32 says, he looked around to see who had done it. And the implication is he just keeps turning around and around and around, looking at all the different people in the crowd around him uh, because he wants to know who just got healed? Uh, here's Luke 8, 45. Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. So remember, this lady had intended to just come in, touch, be healed, and get out. But apparently the moment she feels the energy flowing in and healing him, Jesus, within seconds, says, who touched me? And then makes kind of the big deal with the apostles. No, I know someone touched me because I felt power go out of me to heal. And so she decides that she needs to fess up. Now, it scares her. Because, well, for some of the obvious reasons I was just talking about, uh, she shouldn't have been touching anybody. She shouldn't have been in this crowd because she is off limits, uh, ceremonially unclean and uh, communicating that uncleanliness uh, to other people. Uh, and that bears probably some um, community punishment uh, for not taking uh, proper care for that. Uh, but also... She has gained the attention of a very powerful person in her mind, the Messiah. And what if he doesn't approve of this? What if he considers this um, some sort of assault upon his person or the theft of his power? And so she is scared, but she comes and acknowledges everything everything. And I, I really think it would be interesting to hear the take of some of the people in that crowd 
as she's talking, uh, how they might have been horrified about the idea. Oh my goodness, this woman touched me when she was unclean? Oh no, I've got to go through ceremonies to get myself fixed now. Uh, But Jesus totally, uh, totally calms down the situation. Uh, Here is verse 48 of Luke 8, where we're at. She said to her, or he said to her, daughter, which means that she might be younger than Jesus. Uh, Now, she knows, we know she's had this problem for about 12 years. So she's likely to be in her upper 20s, maybe early 30s. So Jesus is about second half of his 30s at this point. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And so he approves of it and sends her on her way uh, because uh, of her faithfulness uh, in seeking this this salvation from him uh, by just simply touching his garment. And we don't know anything more about her. It's possible that she is one of the Galilean ladies that ends up following Jesus and will be down in Jerusalem uh, at the time of his crucifixion. We don't know that for sure, but it would make good sense uh, that uh, this would change her life in such a huge fashion. At this point, I want to go to um, Mark chapter 5, verse 35. Uh, where it says, While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Uh, So we know that when Yairus arrived at Matthew's house, that his daughter was at her end. She was at the terminal point. Uh, in her illness. While Jesus is on the way, apparently she has died, and a messenger arrives to tell Jairus, you might as well never mind about trying to get Jesus here to heal her because she's already dead. Don't don't bother him anymore. Uh, But Jesus hears this, uh, this recommendation. Verse 36, But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Uh, Just trust me, trust me. Uh, And uh, verse number 37, He allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Uh, So this is where we see the inner circle of the apostles. Uh, We've got this tightening of the disciples. We have the larger group of disciples out of which Jesus selected 12. And then out of that 12 apostles, he has three specific uh, that he considers to be his inner circle. uh, And these guys become kind of the leader of the church. Uh, Peter, of course, is the one that preaches on the day of Pentecost. Uh, James is the first one to be executed for his preaching. And then John is the last one uh, to still be alive in the time of the Revelation being written at the end of the first century. So these are the three inner circle that Jesus says, you three come with me into the house. Verse 38, They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And this is a cultural thing, that uh, on the day of the death, you're going to have the funeral. And so everything happens really fast. As soon as the death occurs, uh, we've got professional mourners that will show up. More than likely, they're kind of hovering around uh, whenever there's a a sickness. 
And so these professional mourners show up to kind of help set the stage for the sadness of the family. Uh, and so these are the guys that are there. They've, they brought some musical instruments that go along with this type of mourning. And so they are making a lot of noise now that the lady, the young lady, is dead. Now, verse 39, when he had entered the house, meaning probably into the courtyard, because the head of the synagogue is likely to be upper middle class or uh, uh, higher class in the society of this community. So he's going to have a Mediterranean-style home that has a central courtyard with all of the rooms that are around it. So this is where all these weeping and wailing people are at. So when he enters into that area, the inner courtyard, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Now Jesus uh, is using this term, sleeping, meaning she's just temporarily dead. I'm going to wake her up in a moment here. So why are you going on and on about her being permanently dead and needing to be buried? Now, these professionals, of course, immediately start laughing and mocking Jesus. They laughed at him uh, because they knew she was dead, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be here doing their services. Uh, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those that were with him and went into where the child was. So, he gets rid of the professional mourners, sends them out of the house. So they're out of the courtyard. Uh, and then he takes Peter, James, John, mom and dad, and they go into one of the residence areas, one of the sleeping rooms, the, the little girl's sleeping room. And they are all by themselves whenever Jesus performs this miracle of resurrection. And uh, because of our time constraints, we will have to mark our place right there and get back into the Word tomorrow.